Namaste, I bow to the indwelling spirit within each and every one of us. May the divine within us enlighten and guide us to realize that humanity is the uniting religion. Pr pr the breath, the uniting prayer and consciousness, the uniting God. This is especially important in this divisive time that we live in. And also today as we talk about bhakti yoga, because that instead of uniting everyone can sometimes be very divisive. If we don't understand the true message of bhakti. Okay, so let us all realize our unity. And to me, you are all my brothers and sisters on the path. Okay, and uh, I'm going to pay respects to my Satguru, Yogi Raj Gurunath Siddhanath and ask for his blessings for all of us today at this satsang. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshvara, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasme, Shri Guru Ve Namaha. So today we're going to be talking about bhakti and karma yoga, two pathways to self-realization. Now, before we go on to anything specific, we should step a little bit back and uh, ask ourselves, what are we looking for in our life? Okay, why are you listening to me talk about these pathways to self-realization? What is your goal? What is your objective? What do you want out of life or out of this workshop or satsang? Okay, so people may want so many different things. We don't all agree on what we want. Okay. We want to be free from stress. Uh, we want to be happy. We want to be wealthy. We want to have a better job. Okay, we, uh, you know, just want to have freedom from fear. We want freedom from a boss that is uh, always picking on us or Whatever it is that uh, we want, we have so many desires that we want out of life. Okay, so you should identify what you want and how you can achieve what you want. Now we have so many desires, so many ways. I mean, can you get enough wealth? Can you get enough uh, material pleasure? What, how much is enough? And new house, new car, okay. A lot of gold, will that make you happy? What will make you happy? We can never satisfy all our desires when you satisfy one desire and you are not, all, all of you have the experience. You become you know, desiring of something else or more of the same. And then you're also afraid of losing what you have. Okay, the more you have, the more fear you have that someone will steal from you. 
If you have nothing, nobody can steal anything from you. Okay, so we're living in a very uh, stressful world where our desires are never fully satisfied. As they say, I get no satisfaction. Okay, so how, what are we going to do? So the sages have said, and this is my experience also, if you focus on the divine, if you put all your desires into one desire for the divine, for God, whoever you call it, whatever you call it, your true self, and you achieve that true self, you know your own self, you experience your own self, then all your desires will be automatically satisfied. Okay, because then you need nothing else. Okay, so that is what I'm talking about. If you want to uh, learn some mantras to become more wealthy, that's a different workshop. Or you want to achieve some cities, you know, some powers, that's not what you're going to get from bhakti and karma yoga. Okay, so that's something different. So you need to focus on what we're here all about, which is self-realization. Now, you may ask, you know, I, why is it so difficult? Why are there so many pathways? I have to do different uh, satsangs on different pathways to self-realization. Why is that? Well, you're not the first one to ask that. Okay, believe it or not, um, Parvati was having a hard time with Lord Shiva. Okay, because uh, every time Lord Shiva came up with a new yoga, a new path to uh, the divine, to the true self, he would instruct Parvati and tell, hey, Parvati, Parvati, I got a new, new yoga I want to teach you. So he keeps doing that, and the poverty is getting a little bit, you know, like, oh, my God, what's going on? I've learned so much, so many different yogas. Can't you just give one or two and, and be done with it? You know, why give so many? Okay, so Lord Shiva, he laughed, and he said, there are so many different types of people in the world, so many people with different needs and desires, Someone this way of coming to me, another one, another way to come to me. They don't resonate with the one yoke. Okay, so what can I do? I have to keep coming up with new ways, new paths for them to come to me. Okay, they, otherwise they will get bored. They won't be able to complete their journey. Okay, so that's why I have to so many. And, you know, the number he came up with, I've got 84,000 yogas okay so that just means there's almost as many yogas as there are people in the in the world okay but not all of them are popular not all of them are available to all of us and some of them will be taught to the higher beings when they reach certain states of consciousness okay so all we need to know is as a great Kriya master noticed and he observed that, and this is Paramahansa Yogananda, who brought Kriya Yoga into the United States. He observed there are many paths to the top of the mountain, but once you're there, the view is the same. Okay, so don't worry. We may talk a lot about different types of yoga. Okay, today we'll talk about karma yoga and bhakti yoga. Uh, what does it mean? What do they mean? How do they work together? Or how do they work separately? If that's what it is. But once we understand what they are, okay, I will also share some experience, my own experience with some of these things. 
and uh, some examples from the great beings that have trod the path of bhakti and karma yoga. And then we're going to look at, well, okay, that's great for these people, but how do we take this into our lives? How do we apply this in our spiritual practice? Okay, how do we apply this in our life when we're not doing our spiritual practice? And so we'll cover some of that. That's what we're trying to cover today. Okay, and so I hope you enjoy it, relax, and let's have some fun, if possible. Now, first of all, I normally teach and give workshops on Kriya Yoga or other kinds of uh, yoga. Okay, I don't uh, particularly focus on bhakti or karma, but it just so happened that I was actually brought up in a bhakti karma yoga household, okay, because I was born in a family of Sikhs, okay, so the Sikhs are a path, they call it a religion now, but in the uh, original, when uh, Guru Nanak founded this path. It was called the Nanak Nanak Panth, the path of Nanak, Guru Nanak. He was someone who lived in the late 1400s, early 1500s, and he was a great uh, yogi. And he lived at a time when there was a great upsurge of what we call the Bhakti movement. Movement of devotions, that's what bhakti is all about, is about devotion to the divine. Okay, whatever chosen deity you want, you think about, it's the devotion to the divine. Now, at this time, there have been a lot of these uh, bhaktas, and uh, in many different parts of India, they were all discovering this bhakti yoga and presenting it. It started, you know, in the 14th century with uh, Kabir, and then there was Namdev, Tukaram, okay, and uh, then there was uh, Nanak Devji. Okay, so uh, he was a young person in uh, Punjab when he had a extraordinary experience okay, so every day he would go to the river to take a bath in the morning before he started his prayers okay and uh, one day he didn't come back from the river and everybody started searching for him okay he's lost was he washed away so all the family members, friends and stuff started looking for him, but they couldn't find him. They gave up and they thought he must be gone now. But three days later, he walked back into town as if nothing had happened. He'd had a spiritual experience of a very high order and he became a changed person. He gave up his work and uh, he started wandering and talking to other teachers and masters all over India and even outside of India. And he became well known as a great teacher. Okay. So before he settled back into Punjab, one time he was visiting Mecca, okay? that is the the main base of the Muslim religion. And it was a long trek and he was very tired when he reached Mecca and he laid down and went to sleep. In the morning, the residents were scandalized because he had his feet turned towards the holy spot, Kaaba. 
okay, and Mecca and the Kaaba itself. So they said, oh my God, this guy is a heretic. We need to uh, make an example of him. We're going to, you know, punish him or whatever it is. So great, great crowds gathered. And uh, the, some of the, the clerics, they came to him and say, young man, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you, you know, a heretic? Why are you sacrilegious? Why are you this, you know, being so, uh, you know, naughty and, and pointing your feet at our holy place? So Nanak said, I'm sorry. I mean, it's okay. I mean, I, I had no idea. You can move my feet any direction where God isn't, and I'll be happy. Now, that, of course, stopped them in their tracks, because where could they say God isn't? Is it in the east, west, north, south, top, bottom? Okay, so they were stumped. They said, oh, okay, holy person. Please just, you know, take your feet off and 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 go off. We won't we won't say anything. We won't do anything. So that's one of the stories about uh, the Guru Nanak. Okay, so he taught a devotional path, but he also taught a path of work. Because all of the people that came to him were householders. He himself was a householder. He had a wife. He had children. Okay. And uh, one of his, his eldest son, Sri Chand, okay, is considered to be a manifestation of Gorakshanath, of Lord Shiva himself. Okay. And he lived from hundreds and hundreds of years, and there was a great yogi of the Nath Sampradai, Sri Chan. But Guru Nanak, he talked to the siddhas, and uh, he said, you know, you guys have too extreme your practice. It's really not suitable. You know, it would take too much effort and too much work, and you have to renounce the world and go off and practice all these hard things, okay? I, I want to look after the normal people, okay? So I want to teach them how to find God while working, how, while raising a family. And so that's how the Sikhism, the path of Sikhism rose from that. And uh, he consecrated a, uh, uh, one of his disciples to be the next teacher, the next guru, and so on and so forth, until the 10th guru, 10th generation. At that time, the 10th guru was locked in a war with the Muslim conquerors, and he was sorely wounded, and uh, he was not able to pass the, to anybody else the guruship. And so he said, let the collection of all the Guru sayings, all the teachings of the Gurus which have been collected into this book, which we call the Guru Granth Sahib, okay, the Adi Granth. And this will be your Guru from now on. And he passed. And that's the family I was born in. Okay, so... Uh, the teaching was such that, you know, the practice, what we call abhyas, is that every morning you have to recite certain prayers, set certain uh, uh, sayings of the, uh, of the gurus, and they've been collected into a little book called the Nitnam, the sacred Nitnam. And uh, you recite them at least three times a day. Okay, so in the sacred Nitnam, the, the Guru Bani's and uh, 
sayings of the of the gurus they talk about nam the name of god repeating jap nam jap that's what they taught okay repeat the name of god constantly and do your work selflessly okay look after the community look after your fellow beings and keep the name of god in your heart and that was the bhakti path that i was uh, i was born in now obviously at that time as a young person i was not that appreciative of it of course uh, and uh, you know whenever you're born into something you feel like you're forced into it you have no choice okay so it took me many years to uh, you know appreciate the path that it is when i went to the temple the gurudwara the 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 you know house of the guru and listen to the chanting and the 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 singing and then the the you know the priest you know the gyani we call the person with knowledge the gyani would you know give a homily pick some words from the the holy book and give a uh, a teaching for the day you know and then you listen to a lot of chanting you know that's the only thing i liked about the going to the temple was all the chanting okay there was always harmonium there was the the tabla and then there was always this okay the chimta okay which actually comes from the nath yogis it's actually used for the sacred fire it's actually the tong but uh, the sikhs actually you know have adapted it for the the gurbani the chanting to the name of god okay so these three instruments are always playing you know at the uh, in the temple and it was uh, always very comforting to me but i was not particularly interested in the uh, talking all the things they were saying and all that you know so the later on when i actually appreciated uh, the path of uh, of the the sikhs i was already on a totally different uh, pathway okay so but it is a very uh, 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 good path also but it did not satisfy me okay i thought i i wanted something more okay the guru nanak taught a gradual path where it's called simran okay the first thing is that you acknowledge the presence of the divine and you start towards the divine then you collect knowledge and understanding try to go to satsangs go to listen to the words of the saints and you try to get some understanding of the divine of god and then you make more effort okay practice what the saints teach and all that and then the fourth step those are the first three steps of simran the fourth step is the grace of god you need the divine giving you grace and then you can achieve a unity consciousness with the divine so guru nanak taught the samadhi of sahaj sahaj samadhi sahaj samadhi is an effortless samadhi but it is always there okay so it is ever present it's called it's that's why it's ever effortless you don't have to sit and meditate it's always there sahaj samadhi ever present no matter whether you're eating sleeping whatever work you're doing even if you're making babies it is sahaj samadhi okay so that is the path 
that was taught. But because of the selfless work, in order to uh, offer up all the work that you do to the divine, you have to renounce the results of the work. Okay, so that is a dispassion, vairagya. So you have abhyas, the practice, and vairagya, which is dispassion or renounce, desires and the fruits of your work. So one of the great gurus in the, in the Sikh Panth, uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur, I would always very find myself very connected with uh, this particular guru because he had great, uh, you know, uh, uh, passion, vairagya. He lived his life in vairagya and he died in vairagya. What do I mean? Okay, it so happened that he's the ninth guru. He was the father of the tenth guru. And during his time, the Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, he was persecuting the Hindus and especially the, the pundits of Kashmir. There were all these great uh, learned pundits in uh, Kashmir who were the leaders of the Hindu movement. And he was forcing them to convert to the Muslim religion. If they didn't, he killed them. So he was doing it every day. He would select one person. And if they didn't, you know, if they, okay, are you going to convert? No, he would do that. So the Kashmiri pundits were really in deep prob, you know, they were very su much suffering. And so they prayed to Lord Shiva and Shiva, Lord Shiva, uh, appeared to one of them and said, go to the house of Nanak and take refuge there. Okay, so they had a delegation of these pundits went to Punjab from Kashmir and they approached Guru Tank Bahadur and told them their problem. So Guru Tank Bahadur said, the solution requires the sacrifice of a good man. Okay, so they say, okay, well, what do we do? He says, you don't have to worry, I'll take care of it. And so he approached the emperor, Aurangzeb, and he said, stop persecuting the, the pundits in Kashmir. If you can convert me, one person, then they will all convert to the Muslim religion. So Aurangzeb said, oh, that's good. I mean, instead of, you know, going one at a time to thousands of uh, people, I just have to get you. Okay, let's do it. So he imprisoned uh, Guru Tek Bahadur. And even while he was in prison, Guru, this uh, Tek Bahadur, he composed some of the best uh, shloks and uh, poetry and <clears throat> hymns to the divine in prison while he was beaten and over weeks and every day they would ask him to uh, convert, but he refused. And finally, Aurangzeb was out of patience. He said, I'll chop off his head. And uh, if he doesn't convert, just chop off his head. They gave him the ultimatum. He refused to convert, and they chopped off his head. So he gave up his life for others. And he had no regrets. That is the kind of consciousness that uh, is possible. Of course, in the normal run of things, I mean, how many of such people are there in the world anymore? But I give that as an example, these Guru Nanak or Guru Tag Bahadur, they give exa they are examples of how this path is able to pr produce really holy people, great saints and yogis. Okay. So, of course, this took, you know, uh, 
long time for me to understand, but that's where I was, uh, you know, brought up. When I was young, I had to go to the temple and uh, we had to do seva, which it means that we had to wash the dishes because there's uh, free langar or, um, you know, meals served every Sunday or in, on feast days, uh, you get free meals at, uh, served at the uh, temple. And uh, everybody is welcome. And uh, we would serve the food and we would wash the dishes. And in those days, uh, the women didn't have to do any of this. <laughs> it was all men and on Sunday, the women got a break from uh, doing their household chores. Okay, so the man had to clean up the dishes and the, the, the gurdwara and serve the food. And my father actually uh, was one of the cooks at the gurdwara that uh, would um, do seva to cook the dal and the sabji. So that's how you did service for, for others there, okay, even at the temple. Moving from this particular bhakti and karma path okay we moved to when i went to school okay i went to catholic school so my my catholic school the high school was called st joseph's college and where we i was uh, living you know the the college are actually the high schools okay it's a british colony and uh, every morning we were taught to do our Hail Marys and uh, do our, our Father, the Lord's Prayer every morning before we start our studies. Okay, so, and then in the studies, there was biblical knowledge. We had to learn different books of the Bible. There was ethics and catechism. So the, the priests, the fathers and the brothers, they were constantly trying to tell us about the Catholic religion. And I was quite impressed because I really connected when I read about, you know, Jesus, you know, and I, and he seemed such a, such a fantastic guy i mean i was a little bit you know i love forgiveness and uh, you know love thy neighbor as thyself and all that stuff so the message was fantastic and uh, the practice it seemed to me like it was very similar to what um, i was taught in uh, in the growing up in the, a sikh family and going to the the gurdwara Okay, because, um, you know, as I say, every morning we had to uh, recite things. But, you know, the, the first part of the Nitnam is the Jap G, which is composed by Guru Nanak. And uh, it begins what we call in the Mul Mantra, okay, which actually starts as Ik Unkar Satanam which means God is one. He is the eternal Om. Truth is his name. Okay, so I said, wow, that's pretty good. I mean, you know. And then it says, Karta Purak, the creator is everywhere. Nirbhau, nirvair, without suffering, without a second. Akal murat ajuni, deathless, formless, without birth, sebang, self illuminated, guru prasad jap, repeat the name of God to get his blessings. So I said, wow, that's really, you know, I, I had to, you know, memorize and recite that every day and things like that. 
And then when I came to the, the Catholic school, then we had to say, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I mean, I can go with that. I thought, wow, this, you know, it's not that bad, not so different. I mean, when you look at this and I said, wow. So I, I said, you know, it seems like, you know, the, the Catholic or the Christianity is also a bhakti thing. I mean, it's a devotion to God, right? I mean, you take away the, the scary parts of the Old Testament where God punishes everybody. I mean, you know, that, that's a bit difficult. But, you know, in the New Testament, it's all about forgiveness, right? I mean, uh, Jesus saved the prostitute, you know, who was going to be stoned by the crowds. And he said, okay, go ahead. Let the person who is without sin pick up the first stone, I mean. I said, wow, good for you, Jesus. I was very impressed with the whole uh, Christian message, the, the Catholic Church. And uh, then there was the, the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Now, everybody was going mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. When it comes to, you know, pray for us now and at the hour of our death, everybody made it louder. It became very loud when it became pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And I said, good, my God, you know, the divine feminine, the mother, you know, is uh, is, uh, is is great. He'll, he'll take care of us. You know, won't let us die in pain and all that stuff. So, it it seems like it's a it's a it's it's resonated this with me and said it's very similar. So even after many years of studying in uh, in school, they couldn't really convince me to to take up the. The, to be baptized and, and stuff. Actually, I got baptized much later when I went to university. <laughs> but that's a different story. Okay, so I became a Catholic much later. Okay, but not during this time. I mean, uh, and uh, it was, it was uh, very uh, interesting. But I, I figured, you know, bhakti, very nice. Now, in the school, there was a lot of karma yoga also okay because uh you know of my upbringing i would volunteer and uh i joined a uh, a number of society clubs in high school one of them was called the interact club and it was sponsored by the rotary international and uh, we would uh do projects we would uh, go and uh, help out like we would do uh, fundraising and collect toys and then we would go to the forbidden city Kowloon city and then at christmas give out gifts you know while the uh, the tongs the the triads were smiling and you know they had their hatches out if uh, we made any trouble but uh, even the police would not go there but we actually went there and uh, and uh, you know gave out gifts to the poor kids in the forbidden city of Kowloon, and um, you know uh, we had another project where we would uh, uh, went and painted a uh, a floating clinic. One of the ferries in uh, in Hong Kong was converted into a floating clinic for the boat people of Hong Kong. Okay, so. They, these people lived on their boats. They don't come on land very often. And uh, so they had this uh, ferry that was converted into a clinic and uh, the boat people to come and visit and get inoculated, get medicine and all that stuff. And we would go and clean it up, 
paint it and do repair on it uh, every now and then. One of my most uh, memorable projects that I, and there were many over the seven years I was there. And uh, one of them, which was very nice, was uh, we actually uh, built a playground on a remote island called Lantau Island at that time. This is in the 1960s. And uh, now, of course, Lantau Island has been very built up because that's where the international airport is. But at that time, it took you to take, you know, take you two hours plus to get there on a, on a river, on a boat. And, uh, you know, there was only a few fishermen and, uh, you know, some farmers and things like that on the, uh, on the island. They had a school and the school did not have a regular playground. It only had a dirt field. And so they had, uh, you know, uh, presented a proposal for us to, uh, to uh, build a playground. And so we accepted and we went there and we spent several weeks. Uh, what we had to do was we bought the cement, bags of cement, and uh, we had to uh, push the cement. There were no cars. We had to hand push on carts the cement bags over a period of a week or two over a mile and a half two miles from the ferry pier where they unloaded and and take them to the to the where the playground would be and uh every night we would uh, sleep on the on the desks we just took there was no bed so we took the the desks and tables and put them together and we would sleep on top of them uh with our uh, our sleeping bags and uh you know we would uh take our bath in the nearby river every night because we were all hot and sweaty it was very it was summer in hong kong and believe me it was hot and muggy okay and after doing pushing the cement uh, for uh, all day long it was uh, very tiring, but we really had fun, and we would eat with the villagers at night, and we would go. We would, we would be asleep just like that, and we did that for several weeks. And then, when all the bags of cement was uh, ready, we uh, had the uh, concrete mixer that we rented, and it came over, and we had an expert to teach us how to put the mix the concrete, and we poured it, and we had a you know had some mistakes but overall we we managed to to have a uh, concrete uh, uh, playground which wouldn't become mud during the monsoon rain in hong kong the problem with the dirt uh, playground was that it was not really usable because uh, of the rain and uh, and the dirt you know the wind and all that stuff so uh this they were able to put a, uh, some um, basketball pitches on and other things and so it was a very happy thing to see the kids all happy they turned out uh, on the first day of school we actually went back to the uh, the, the island school the school there and there was a big ceremony and of course they the headmaster thanked us and we were all there and we basked and all the kids were running around and you know hugging us and having a great time now of course you know uh, we took the the pleasure of uh, of having doing it and uh, we got our thanks but normally speaking in karma yoga you would do it out without thinking whether anybody would thank you or whether anybody would praise you, okay? But hey, we were just high school kids. You know, that, that was fine by me at that time. But, you know, I was very much into, uh, into service and uh, I was volunteering for a lot of uh, service work and taking care of uh, old people in the old people's home, visiting them. So it was it, it was very satisfying time for me from a karma yoga perspective. Now it's nice to you know for you uh, for me to share some of my experience on bhakti and and karma yoga. Okay, um, later on, I mean, I I, I 
had other opportunities to uh, to practice bhakti and and karma yoga, uh, but you know, let's before I talk about talk about those things. It's time we took a more, you know, clinical view of uh, the topic of bhakti and uh, karma. Now, traditionally, yoga was called jnana yoga in the time, in the ancient times, the yoga of knowledge. This was the great sages. They would directly meditate and uh, pass from their mind, manas. They would go beyond their mind, go into their higher consciousness, and from their higher consciousness, they would go and unify with their true self. Okay, this was a direct path of knowledge. And so bhakti and karma yoga were not known. They were, of course, uh, part, but they weren't called yoga. I mean, you're expected to do seva when you went to an ashram, even in ancient times, and stay there to learn from a teacher. The teacher will make you sweep the ashram for a year before, you know, he will teach you anything. Okay, so, and uh, bhakti is because, you know, in the in those days uh, everything you know they although the in the ultimate uh, sanatan dharma there's only one divine the whole universe is one but you know in order to approach different parts of the divine they recognize many different names of the divine so these become, you know, what popular in popular Hinduism, they became known as gods, devas and devis and things like that. And so there was always a current of, uh, of bhakti and you were brought up with, uh, you know, this uh, current of uh, bhakti even as a child. So there was no need for any separate bhakti yoga because uh, everybody was doing bhakti as a child and uh, as a cause of uh, their day. Okay, so bhakti yoga and kama yoga, seva was not separate from their daily life. Okay, they were meant to do their work and uh, they would uh, chant to the divine, they would do their pujas and they would uh, recognize different aspects of the of the divine okay so young children were taught very early on chance to recognize the different divinities okay so in the morning they would uh, you know wake up and uh, they were taught to say you know look at their hands you're going to do work today and you have to you know, make your uh, hands uh, holy. Okay, so they say, Karagre Vasate Lakshmi, Karmule Saraswati, Karmadye Tu Govinda, Prabhate Kardarshanam. Okay, so they say at the tip of my fingers is the Divine Mother Lakshmi, at the base, it's Divine Saraswati, and in the middle is the Lord Krishna. So my hands are holy. Okay, then they make their feet holy because they have to step on Divine Mother, which is the earth, the holy earth. So they say, Samudravasane Devi Parvatastana Mandite Vishnu Patni Namastubiyam Padaspasham Shamaspame. This asks, O Divine Mother, Okay, the consort of uh, Vishnu. Pardon me that I'm going to step on you with my feet, make my feet holy. Okay, so the hands and feet are already made, you know, uh, holy through their devotion to different aspects of the divine. Then they will ask the Lord Ganesh to remove all obstacles for them. So they'd say, 
Vakratunda Mahakaya Koti Surya Samaprabha Nirvignam Kuru Me Deva Sarva Karyeshu Sarvada Remove all obstacles from my life and from my work. Okay, so Lord Ganesh is the great remover of obstacles. I can go on and on. I mean, when they take their shower, then they would have another uh, mantra to do the shower, invoking the, the rivers, the holy rivers from Ganga, Yamuna, and all the other holy rivers. They would go out and, you know, ask for the blessings of the divine sun, the maker of the day, the giver of light. Okay, and so on and so on. Okay, so they would pray to the nine planets so that uh, the karma will not harm them so much. Okay, let us, you know, make things easy for us. And they would ask the divine to uh, give them light from darkness, lead them from death to immortality. Okay, so all this is already learned. So bhakti was, so what happened? Why was there bhakti yoga? How did that happen? Okay. Bhakti yoga was actually put systematically first in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. Both bhakti yoga and karma yoga were introduced first in the Bhagavad Gita. More than, you know, there would be like, you know, conservatively 3,000 years ago to uh, actually the time of Lord Krishna is like 5,000 years ago, okay, which would be like 3,000 BC. So at his time, it was said that there would be coming the Kali Yuga. And so the Gyan Yoga is going to be very difficult. And uh, so that's why Lord Krishna introduced the Bhakti Yoga separately and uh, the Kama Yoga into the Bhagavad Gita. Now, it wasn't until many thousands years thousands of years ago later during the middle ages that bhakti movement actually took became strong before that there were other yogic movements but the time was right in india in the middle ages for the message of bhakti and karma yoga okay so what did lord krishna teach in the bhagavad gita in the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Gita, our Gita, it's really about karma yoga. Chapter one to six is karma yoga. Chapter seven to 12 is bhakti yoga. And uh, from 13 to 18, it's actually gyan yoga. He actually taught the Gyan Yoga in there. So all three yoga are given in progression. He first gave the Karma Yoga. And then he gave the Bhakti Yoga. And finally, he gave the Gyan Yoga. But he said, you know, Gyan is so difficult. Okay, people are not able to do it, but he still he gave six chapters on the on knowledge and wisdom at the end of the uh, of the Bhagavad Gita. How you can achieve through Jnan on Jnana, okay, the the unity with the divine, self realization or God realization. So he taught that. You know, you can come to me just by 
moving from your manas, which is the emotional mind, our normal mind that we have, the agitated mind, if you can calm it by practice and move into the buddhi, which is the higher mind, the buddhic mind, and then from the buddhic mind connect with the atma, the atma is connected with me, and so you will be fully connected 24 hours a day with me. Okay, so that is the high road of Gyan Yoga. But he said it's very difficult, and in Kali Yoga, very few people will be able to do that. Okay, so he said, look, if you can't do that, you know, do yoga, meditate, do abhyas, make effort. Okay, and move, you know, purify your mind and slowly focus on me and achieve the different states of meditation, you know, from Savikap Samadhi to Nirvikap Samadhi. And when you get to Nirvikap Samadhi, you can merge with me. Okay, so he said, that's another way to do it. And then he said, well, if you can't make that kind of effort, if you can't do a regular spiritual practice, then at least when you are doing your regular day-to-day -day work, okay, think of me, offer all the fruits of your work to me. Okay. Think of me all the time, wow, whatever you're doing, and offer up the fruits of your work to me and uh, seek to become one with me. And eventually you will find me and you will uh, be one with me. So that was the third method he taught. And then he said, now, if you can't, always be thinking of me and offering up the fruit of your work to me. The easiest path, the fourth path, okay, is to separate it out, okay? At least when you're doing your work, don't worry about the outcome. Don't care about, you know, how it affects you. Okay? Don't take credit for your work. Okay, let go of the, the, the praise and let go of the, the condemnation, you know, criticism. Just do it without expectation of what will happen. And also chant my name whenever you can and eventually these two the karma and the bhakti will converge and merge together and uh, you will be able to come to me okay so that was the fourth path okay where he thought that most of the people would be able to do that and in fact that's how a lot of people are approaching it okay that's how it, it was done in the in the Sikh uh, path right where we were chanting is the the lord's name and uh satanam why guruji satanam why guruji and uh we would uh do our work and not worry about uh, the outcome. We would do our best, but we are not tied to the results. Okay, that is the seva. That is the mentality of seva. Okay, so that that's what uh, resonates uh, a lot with me, and that is actually the message of Lord Krishna. 
in the in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay? And uh, it's it's doable. It's workable, it's livable. Now it's interesting and I'll diverge a little bit and talk to you about Kriya Yoga. I'm not going to talk about Kriya Yoga today in any detail because that's the topic of the third uh, satsang that I want to have with you. But you should realize that in the Bhagavad Gita, Kriya Yoga is considered a Karma Yoga. It's a yoga of action. Okay, but in Kriya, we have Babaji has given it to us and integrated the, the bhakti and jnan with it. Okay, but Kriya actually means Kriya. Kri comes from Karma. It's action. Kriya means action with awareness. Awareness of what? It's action with awareness of the divine, of your true self. All Kriya is, is acting with the divine awareness. Okay. It is similar to what Lord Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is similar to the Dharma. It's similar to the, uh, 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 the, the, the hukam or the, the fateh of the, of the Sikh, the law, the, 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 the command of God. Or in the Nath tradition, Adesh, what is the Adesh? What is the will of God? The will of the Guru. Okay. So if you can act in that moment, all your actions are in the divine, that is called Kriya. And in uh, chapter 4, which is part of the Karma Yoga section, in chapter 4, I believe it is uh, verses 29-30, Lord Krishna mentions the different types of sacrifice and in, uh, that is done. That is the internal sacrifice, the fire ceremonies, okay? offering to the divine. And in verse 29-30 is where he mentions that some offer the incoming breath to the outgoing breath and the outgoing breath to the incoming breath by controlling their pran. And that is Kriya Yoga. The Kriya breath of Kriya Yoga is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, in the verse 29 and 30 of chapter 4. And it's in the section of Karma Yoga. So actually for all Kriya Yogis, we are asked to uh, study the chapter four and five and of the, or, or any chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, but especially those uh, two chapters. So, it turns out that even after I went and found my master and practiced Kriya Yoga, it's not that different from the, the Karma Yoga and uh, Bhakti because uh, we, you know, are offering up our breath to Divine Lord Shiva with every inhalation and then to the Divine Mother Shakti with every exhalation. Okay. And uh, so we're repeating the name of the divine with every breath. Okay. So that is bhakti. And we do chanting in Kriya Yoga also. Right? We would chant Nama Shivaya 
Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya, Om Nama Shivaya, Shi, Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya. You can chant, okay, and um, you know the to be have the 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 bhakti. And uh, you know the good thing about bhakti is that you can't make a mistake. Now, when I was doing some of the mantras earlier, you heard me doing some of the mantras. Um, you'd still have to get the pronunciation right and 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 stuff like that. But if you're doing bhakti, which means you are chanting to God and you are being devoted to God. There's never any mistake. You cannot make any mistake. You do whatever you want and God will be fine. Okay, there's, <laughs> he'll take care of you. She will take care of you, whether you are divine, chanting divine mother or to Lord Shiva or Lord Krishna, you can never make a mistake. Okay, so, and so you can chant alone uh, if you want to and go into your, what we call, Chanting can get you into what we call bhava samadhi. Bhava is the emotion. Okay, so bhava samadhi is when in the long chanting sessions you get into the zone and you go into a samadhi state. Okay, so it's a very joyful state. And uh, you can start laughing and uh, feeling very peaceful. Nothing can harm you and you are in this peaceful, happy state. It's a bhava samadhi. Okay, so chanting can be very nice. Now, you know, you can, like I was doing right just now, where I was saying, you know, there are many ways of doing, you know, just a simple chant like uh, the Nama Shivaya. Okay, you can chant like Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya. Nama Shivaya, Nama Shivaya, Om Nama Shivaya, 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 Nama Shivaya. Okay, so and you can do that in different variations, you know. You can do, uh, you know, or if you don't, you know, always remember tunes and stuff like that, you can just. Why a different tune this one. So, you can chant with whoever you want, your favorite chanter. In this case, it's my guru, Shivai. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. So you have many ways of doing it and you should not be scared of chanting to God. Okay, and you will never make a mistake. Okay, um, so I mentioned when I, when I, um, started doing Kriya Yoga, actually I joined a, uh, this was back in the late 80s. Uh, my first Kriya Yoga experience was actually with uh, the Ananda community, with Kriyananda, Swami Kriyananda, who was a direct disciple of Paramhansa Yogananda. And uh, a lot of it was very bhakti. There was, a, I learned to play the harmonium uh, when I was uh, going there uh, all the time. And so besides doing the Kriya Yoga and getting initiated into Kriya Yoga there, I also learned how to play the uh, harmonium and uh, to do the chants of Yogananda. And the good thing about Yogananda, if you look up some of the Ananda and the SRF chants, some of them are in English. So if you have a problem with uh, the Sanskrit chants, you can chant the uh, the english ones you know one of my favorite you know it's door of my heart open wide i keep for thee 
door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me? Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me? Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. So, it's so much bhava, emotional, but it's spiritual emotion. Okay, you generate this energy, the bhava, and then you can put it in your spine and do Kriya afterwards. And it's very powerful. But so there's no excuse for you not to chant to God. Okay? Because there are so many ways of doing it. Okay? You can chant to, you know, the Bodhisattva. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. You can chant to any one of the divine. Okay, so I encourage you to, to do that. Okay. So, so where am I? Oh, yes, with the uh, Bhagavad Gita. So, I talked about how Kama Yoga, now, and the Bhakti and combination of Bhakti, Kama Yoga, and how Lord Krishna invited and gave teachings of how to become one with him. Okay. So, later on, that there was also another scripture for bhakti and uh, it is also a good reference source if you want to look it up it's called the narada bhakti sutra okay, by the sage narad n-a-r-a-d-a -A, the bhakti sutra and it's all about bhakti the whole book and in it Narad, who is actually the divine musician, he's a, he's a big character in the Vedic uh, and the Puranas and uh, everywhere, and um, even the Upanishads. So basically he said that spiritual devotion is not from desire, it's from inner stillness. It's from giving up your desires. Okay, it's from non-attachment. You have to pursue, practice non-attachment in order to develop spiritual devotion. And if you have this inner stillness, this spiritual devotion within you, then all your actions are sanctified. Because when you act with the inner stillness, with the spiritual devotion to the divine, you cannot accumulate any karma, right? Because action, there are two types of action. The action that will give karma and the action that does not give karma, that's called nishkam karma. The term was uh, given by Lord Krishna, nishkam karma. And that's why Lord Krishna said, either offer it to me, or at least don't take credit for it and, and, and don't worry about the results. That's two different things, okay? One is where you offer it up to the divine all the time. You have to be able to keep the divine within you so that you can offer up to the divine. The second, which was the easier one, was just saying, 
I'm not taking care of the, uh, you know, worried about the results. I'm doing this because it's my duty or I'm doing this because it's good for my fellow human beings. It's good for the community. It's good for others. I'm not worried whether it's going to be good or bad for me. Okay. So that's a different, that is also a nishkam karma. So Narad said that if you have this inner stillness that you can develop by non-attachment, then your actions are all nishkam karma. So that's very important to understand. Also, he delineated the different ways of being devoted to the divine. Okay, so it's good to know how are you going to approach the divine? In what way? You can approach as a servant of the divine. You can approach as a friend of the divine. You can approach as a son of the divine. You can approach as a disciple of the divine. And you can approach as the spouse of a divine. An example of the spouse of a divine is Mirabai. Okay, in the Middle Ages, this lady who was a princess, Rajput princess, she was married off to one of the kings, a solar king of the Rajputs, but she was a great Krishna devotee. And she was always chanting the name of Lord Krishna. And, you know, day and night, even when her husband came to him, she would call him Krishna, Krishna. Okay, so it got the people, his, the, the, her husband's family were very upset with him. And they actually tried to poison him. They gave her poison to drink. And she drank it. But Lord Krishna, because she was always thinking of Lord Krishna, because Lord Krishna took away the poison and she did not suffer any harm, even though her in-laws and her, you know, were trying to poison her. Okay. And then finally they let her go and she started wandering around India. She sang devoted songs to Lord Krishna and her songs are collected. They're still sung right now. You can find the songs of Mira. Okay. Her chants to Lord Krishna are famous throughout India. Okay. So she would wander barefoot always with her mind totally devoted to Lord Krishna, Krishna, Krishna all the time until finally one day, she passed by a temple, and in there was a murti of Lord Krishna. And she looked longingly at this murti, and she thought of Lord Krishna, and immediately the murti opened, and she became a rainbow light and merged into Lord Krishna. So that is the story of Mirabai, the Rajput princess who became one with her Lord Krishna, her, her spouse, Lord Krishna. Now, as a son, you can approach as a son. Now, Jesus Christ is an example where he said, Our Father who art in heaven. Right, so he approached bhakti from a child father perspective. But I want to talk to you about another, you know, person, a great saint. That would be Ramakrishna, Paramahansa Ramakrishna. He was a great Kali devotee of Bengal, and he was, he was, he thought of. Gali as his mother and he was so devoted and he was such a great saint 
and he was a yogi and a tantric also but he was so devoted every time he started chanting the about divine mother kali kali would appear to him and he would be in ecstasy okay but the divine mother you know it's like you know this you know when uh, when uh, mother bird is feeding the little baby birds sooner or later the mother bird want the baby bird to fly not stay in the nest and be always waiting for the mother okay so divine mother kali also said you know it's time for you to give up being so attached to me you need to go into a higher state of consciousness nirvikalp samadhi because he was in sarvikalp there was an object subject difference he says you need to merge with me but ramakrishna said no if I, I, I but then i won't be able to experience and enjoy you because i'll be one with you i won't even know you okay because i can't know myself i mean you know i can't enjoy myself i mean what what am i going to do if i'm one with you so he refused all the time but finally the the after some lot of uh, you know cajoling from uh, divine mother kali kali took off took off her sword and gave it to him and said come you need to destroy chop me in two and finally by the grace of divine mother he was able to do it and he achieved a higher state of consciousness the nirvikalp samadhi okay this reminds me of some of the you know zen uh, masters who says what do you do when you meet buddha on the road <laughs> you run him down or what okay so uh but you know to reach that unity state like being one with lord krishna or one with the divine mother you have to go beyond seeing and looking at that okay because that is a lower state of consciousness in bhakti you have to go and be unified in consciousness with them now you can approach as a friend of the divine and uh, an example is uh, sudam okay who was a childhood friend of lord krishna he played with lord krishna they went to the same ashram studied under the same teacher and uh, sudam was a very humble brahmin and uh, you know when they grew up he would uh, you know he went home and uh, of course lord krishna became a king he he ruled dwarka so he had a kingdom but you know they would meet once in a while but for a long time he had they hadn't met and uh, because he was busy and uh, you know sudam was looking after his family but sudam is such a very devoted person to lord krishna and to, well he was you know he, he considered lord krishna his friend he was devoted to the divine in a different form okay but he had great uh, friendship with lord krishna and he enjoyed every moment of time with him so it turned out that after a while he neglected his family's uh, welfare because of his own uh, bhakti and his uh, mother his uh, wife came to him and said look you've got a great friend in lord krishna he's got lots of money and wealth and all these things you know why don't you go to him because we don't even have more than a meal between us now we 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 have no rice no food no wheat please go and ask help from your good friend so to dam say i don't want to ask things from my friend but he says you have to go go so to to dam said okay give me a little bit of puffed rice so at least i can bring something to them so the wife actually used up their last bit of rice they had and uh 
gave him a dish of puff rice because Krishna loved puff rice. And so uh, Sudam went walking and walking to Dwarka. And he came to the palace and he, came, he said to the, you know, uh, palace guard, tell my good friend, Lord Krishna, that Sudam, his boyhood friend, is here to see him. Palace guard said, wow, this poor looking thing. But, you know, they, he said, anyway, he's a Brahmin. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. So he went and told Lord Krishna. Krishna ran out and hugged Saddam and said, oh, my friend, where have you been? Come, come, come. Come in. I have a big feast for you and everything like that, you know. And uh, he says, stay for a while. And Sudam said, no, 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 I have to go back home. But I just wanted to see you. Here's some puff rice. But Krishna said, oh, my God, my favorite. And he ate the puff rice. And he said, this is the best puff rice I've ever had and everything. So they enjoyed hours together. And then Sudam said, I have to take my leave. I have to go back to my family. But Krishna said, OK, but visit again. Don't be a stranger. And he sent his chariot to uh, take uh, Sudam back home. And on the way, Sudam just remember, oh, my God, I forgot to ask him. I was having such a good time. I forgot to ask him to give me money or wealth for my family. Oh, my God, my wife's going to be very upset. Okay, but when he went back home, he said, oh, there's a big palace-looking house there. And there were people milling around and stuff like that. He said, where's my little hut? Okay. Then her, her, his wife ran out and said, oh, Sudam, your friend Lord Krishna built this fine manor for us, this mansion, and has given us all this wealth and food. We'll never be lacking in anything again. Thank you, thank you, and thank Lord Krishna. And Sudam didn't even have to ask. It was done for him by Lord Krishna because he was a friend of Lord Krishna. So you can approach the Lord that way also. Now there's an, you can approach the Lord as a servant of the divine. And uh, example is, In the certain part in the Himalayas, there was a big ashram. And these yogis were meditating night and day, devoted to reaching the highest samadhi and achieving unity with Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva would come down, you know, once in a while and check on their progress, see how they're doing. In this ashram, there was also a temple dedicated to Lord Shiva, a lingam, and, uh, you know, there was an attendant. You know, the, uh, a, a little uh, old man came to the ashram and wanted to join the yogis, but he was not a very learned pe person, and the other yogis said, look, you're only good to clean up the place, okay? So just go and, and take care of the temple and, you know, leave... Maybe in another lifetime, you'll be able to do meditation, okay? And uh, yeah, just chant Om Namah Shivaya. Yeah. And so this old man, all he did was clean the temple and uh, chant Om Namah Shivaya all day long, all the time. He took very well, very good care of that, uh, that temple. And it so happened that uh, this time, Lord Shiva came and to visit the ashram and he came and talked to the yogis and each one would tell them, tell him about their progress, where they are. He would check their state of consciousness and they would ask, well, when will we become liberated? When will we, you know, uh, be, have moksha? And uh, Lord Shiva would say, oh, very soon, very soon. Oh, yeah, you're... One more lifetime and you'll do it. Another person, oh, two lifetime. Oh, not more than three to another person and so on and so forth to everyone. Now, all of these yogis were not so happy because, you know, they've been, do, you know, thought they should be liberated 
in this lifetime and you know and they're told one more lifetime they say oh my god i have to come back again and stuff like that so they were not that happy and then finally lord krishna was about to leave but then the old man who was sweeping the he went to inspect the temple and the old man came and bowed down and touched the lord's feet and said oh lord can you tell me when will i get liberated and uh, lord shiva said open heart in due course my son in due course you will be liberated i guarantee it you will be liberated because you're so devoted to me someday you will be and this old man started dancing and jumping and being so happy and say oh my god some lifetime somewhere i will be liberated oh my god i never thought it would ever happen i'm so happy i'm so happy and then all of a sudden he vanished into light and divine mother parvati was puzzled and, you know of course she was with Lord shiva as well and said what happened how, how did this old man who would need to spend many lifetimes to uh to uh to get liberated she all did he did was chant om namah shivaya and clean your uh your temple she was smiled and said he had given up all expectations he did not think he would get liberated in one two even a thousand lifetimes he he was just working for the sake of the divine and so that enabled him to merge into the divine and achieve self-realization so this is a story of a person who approached the lord as a servant okay so there are many different ways that you can approach the lord and these are the major ways i hope i've given you some ideas and you can think about them how are you going to approach god or the divine your chosen divine now in wrapping up somewhat okay i think you probably you know have enough and uh let's look at now how are we going to uh to uh put this sort of bhakti and karma yoga principles into our life in our daily practice whatever your practice whatever your spiritual practice from a karma yoga perspective you should not worry about the result and you should not worry whether this is a good meditation you know people come to me and say oh i had a horrible meditation or i had a great meditation i had a vision of lord shiva and he you know gave me this and that and all that or the other person i couldn't sit still for a minute my mind was everywhere and oh my god it was horrible that hour i spent sitting at the asan was torture and i said there is no bad meditation that's why my master teaches all meditation practice is good and lord krishna said every effort in meditation is never for get forgotten every effort is remembered for every lifetime okay so there is no bad meditation it's all good don't judge your meditation just do it okay. and when you finish offer it up to the divine or offer it up to lord Krishna, law, offer it up to your guru, law, offer it up to Babaji, whatever. Okay, so don't worry about the results, the path. You just do your practice. That is 
the framework of karma yoga applied to your spiritual practice. Do it for the sake of the practice. Do it for the sake of the divine, of your true self. Don't worry about what progress you're making, how it was today or yesterday, why yesterday was so good, today was so bad. There is no bad. Okay, so that's an important consideration. That is a lesson that we should learn from Karma Yoga. From Bhakti Yoga for your practice, you should do your practice, if you can, focused on the divine. You can also do chanting to the divine before you do your practice and then bring the bhakti energy into your spine or into whatever different meditation you're doing. Okay, your meditation will be better if you've got the divine bhakti energy, devotional energy. Okay, otherwise it becomes very dry, it becomes mechanical. If there's no devotion, it becomes a mechanical practice. And you cannot sustain and do it for many years, which is the road, the journey takes years. So you have to be happy. You have to have devotion. You have to juice the bhava, the emotional support of the divine chanting and listening to chants good chanting yourself whatever it takes okay so for your practice the karma yoga principles and the bhakti yoga practices can help in your daily life from a bhakti perspective one should look at everyone as God as your teacher. Okay. So, you know, the boss who is mean to you, he's a mean boss, but he's also God. He just doesn't know it. Okay. I talk about, oh, all my brothers and sisters, you're all divine to the extent that you know the divine. My master says we are all God to the extent we know God, right? So there is no bad person. There is just person who is doing bad things because they have desire and they have negativity. Their action will generate bad karma, right? So don't, Generate bad karma yourself by being angry or hateful. Be understanding. That is the bhakti. Think of that person as God is teaching you a lesson, whatever it is. Okay, if your wife, you know, is angry and upset with you, or your husband is upset and angry with you. Ask, what can I learn from this? What is the divine saying through my wife, my husband, my teacher, my boss, my friend? And when you speak and act, remember the divine is in your hands and in your feet. And the divine resides in the tip of your tongue. So don't say hateful, harmful, hurtful words. Then you can control your mind. First, you have to control your actions. And then you control your words. Finally, you can control your mind. See the divine, see Babaji, see the divine in each and every one of us, the heart. Then you can say, Namaste, I bow to the indwelling spirit within each 
and every one of us. That is the bhakti and karma yoga perspective of just living your daily life. Don't worry if, oh, I have to do this work, but I'm not going to get paid for it. Or nobody's going to thank me. It doesn't matter. If it is for good, do it. If it is for bad, don't do it. Okay. So that is how you apply the principles of karma yoga and bhakti yoga so that you do not accumulate new bad karma and that you can make progress with your spiritual practice. Now I ask of you, if you haven't already, the exercise that you have to do after this satsang is to think of that aspect of the divine that you resonate with most and bring that into your heart. Don't be so wishy-washy and say, oh, but maybe it's Babaji, maybe it's Buddha, or oh, they're all good, okay, or it's Lord Jesus. Sometimes I think of Lord Jesus, sometimes it's Kuan Yin, okay. Can you at least make one your, 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 your best, your bestie, your BFF? Okay, take one as your bestie, your BFF. Choose. Then you can start developing your bhakti attitude towards that aspect of the divine. It doesn't matter which aspect. Even if you're doing Kriya Yoga, you don't have to take Babaji if you don't want to. Babaji is never jealous. You can do whatever aspect you want. Take Lord Krishna, take Buddha, take Kuan Yin, Lord Jesus. There's no conflict. Be at ease. And, but take some aspect of the divine so that you can develop your bhakti consciousness. Then you can have the suitable chance. You might not feel comfortable doing Om Namah Shivaya. I feel comfortable doing Om Namah Shivaya. I can do Vaiguru every, you know, all the time because that's my upbringing. Okay, but for you it may be different. It may there may be a block to, and you need to find the best one for you. Okay, so once you've chosen somebody. Formulate a bhakti relationship. Choose. Are you going to be a servant, a friend? Okay, the son, the, the disciple. Do you want to be a disciple or do you want to be a, uh, a, a spouse of the divine? There's no harm. I mean, we are all feminine to the divine masculine or we're all masculine to the divine feminine it is not an issue okay so don't get hung up about any of those things so what i would ask you to go through the exercise and see if you can apply it otherwise i will feel that the satsang is not complete without you doing something as well that you have taken something from this satsang. And you can always email me and share with me anything you want. You don't have to tell me your secrets. I don't want to know. But if you want to ask my advice, I'm always available. Okay? So I thank you for your time and your patience. I hope it has been helpful for you. And I hope to see you some of you are in far off land. Even the ones who are in the US here, it's not so easy to see you because of the current situation. But especially those of you in Singapore and Malaysia, I look I hope I look forward to be able to see you guys next year sometime. Oh so go in peace, go safe. Om. Ananda mananda karaprasanam yana swarupam nijabodarupam 
योगेंद्र मेरियम बावरोग्य वायदियम श्रीमात गुरुम नित्यम महम बचामी May you have the blessings of the divine. Om Namah Shivaya. Bolo Sadguruna Maharaj Ki Jai.